The book of Revelation pictures three angels speeding to our planet. They carry urgent messages of warning and hope to prepare us for Jesus' return. These divine prophecies provide us with a vivid window revealing future events for our world. In God's word, a special blessing is promised for all who seek to understand these prophecies. With this in mind, Amazing Facts brings you a new revelation with Doug Batchelor. Author and TV host Doug Batchelor has thrilled thousands around the world with these fascinating presentations. This new revelation seminar is a complete Bible study the whole family will enjoy. Clear-cut logic, spontaneous humor, and beautifully illustrated study guides will bring the Bible to life as never before. Today's message... Has holy wedlock become unholy deadlock? And now, a new revelation. I pray that for everyone who is here tonight, that what they're leaving undone in order to be able to come will get done, they get done as efficiently as if they had been home doing it, or back at work doing it. That nothing will be lost because of the time they're committing to you tonight. Thank you, Father, that in all these things and in so many others for which we don't even know how to ask or think tonight, that you are faithful as you have promised, and you will do it. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Good evening. Glad to see everyone out tonight. We have a lot to cover in our lesson, and so we want to get right into some Bible questions that came in. Once again, we've got a regular uh, bucket load of questions. Forgive us if we don't cover yours. Incidentally, some of the questions that have come in, uh, I, I felt are of a more personal nature. The, some of the questions about relationships and families and marriage, and, and uh, I think it'd be good for you to uh, speak with somebody on a more a counselor or a more personal basis with some of these things. Some of them are more general, and we're, we're including those. Let's begin with this one. How do you fall in love with God? I've known him for about six years, but I'm not in love. Why? Well, I appreciate the person's honesty. Uh, the foundation for success as a Christian is to love God. Love God and obey him. You cannot obey unless you love. Love must be the spring of action. To know God is to love him. I promise you, to know God is to love him. So the effort on your part is going to be to know God. Jesus said, if you knock, the door will be open. If you ask, you will receive. And if you seek, you'll find. Now, I understand in the Greek, I don't speak Greek, but I look it up every now and then. It's a continuing of asking, seeking, and knocking. And if you don't speak Greek, you can turn in your Bibles to Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 13. And this is how the prophet puts it. God is speaking. He says, you will search for me and you will find me when you search for me with all your heart. So in essence, falling in love with God, it's not all of a sudden like pink mashed potatoes falls on you from the sky and you're suddenly in love with God. When you spend time at the foot of the cross, the Bible says we love him because he first loved us. When you see how much he loves you at the cross, it will inspire a reciprocal love in your heart. So spend time with Jesus, looking at Jesus, and you will fall in love with him. Amen? I know that there will be babies in heaven, but will stillborn, miscarried, and aborted babies be in heaven? Very important question. Please answer. Well, I alluded to this. First of all, let me say, the Bible does not address this specifically. There's no scripture that says stillborn babies will be in the kingdom. Let me just share with you what my views are. And I'm, I like to separate when these are my views. Forgive me if you disagree. We'll uh, just continue coming, I hope. In the event that a Christian mother, family, loses a young baby, I think angels will bring that baby to them in the resurrection. The pastor who baptized me, he and his wife lost one of their children while they were doing mission work on a ship on their way to, I believe it was uh, Burma. And she said that uh, she had confidence that angels would bring her that baby she lost. As far as miscarried babies, I don't know. Um, Job makes a reference in his book to being like a stillborn child that was not, or as it had not been. And there he seems to liken a stillborn child 
not that it will be resurrected and saved or in the lake of fire, either one, but may just be as though it had not been. I don't know. Um, so these are some of the things that uh, we'll just have to pray about. I'm sure that we'll be satisfied with God's answers when the time comes. Amen? Family situation here. I was married for five years and was pregnant with our second child when my husband left me, divorced me, and married another woman. My church told me I would go to hell because of it. That was two years ago. Am I free to remarry? That's part one. Okay, we probably part one's plenty in that question. Um, marriage and, and divorce and remarriage in North America is epidemic in its proportions. God's word has not changed. It's not God's will that people should divorce. Divorce is very painful. We're going to talk a little about that tonight. Jesus gives one example of biblical grounds for divorce and remarriage. He says, saving for the cause of fornication. That would be marital infidelity. Now, that would be if a wife was unfaithful to her vows and uh, committed adultery or the husband the partner has biblical grounds to divorce and remarry, that doesn't mean they have to do that. You know, Jesus is in the business of reconciliation. And if the Lord can reconcile people, their marriage becomes an even stronger testimony showing that God is merciful, that he can redeem these marriages that have these uh, you know, deep problems through the grace of the gospel. The definition of fornication I do not believe is limited to if a man goes out and sleeps with a woman and violates his vows. As a pastor, you run into some really strange things. I've had wives come to me and say, what do I do? I found out that my husband was having an affair with another man. Well, I think that would fit the definition that Jesus gave of fornication. Um, and she said, but it's not technically, you know, so there's a, what do you do in a situation where a man beats his wife? Obviously, I think that the woman should get the, herself, and if there's children, out of harm's way. And there should at least be a separation until there's some real uh, redemption in that family. So there's a, it's a very complex issue, uh, but that's the one statement Jesus makes there. Do I have to be a Seventh-day Adventist to be saved? Well, let me hasten to say, first of all, many of you may know that I am a Seventh-day Adventist, and that's why this question, I think, is being spawned. Uh, there's going to be a lot of people in the kingdom other than Seventh-day Adventists. I believe that. And there's going to be a lot of people in the Lake of Fire that were Seventh-day Adventists on church books, but they didn't have their name on the books in heaven. And so a person is not saved by virtue of a denomination. But I will say that what you believe is very important. And, and I think that uh, every element of truth, every doctrine of truth has a freeing aspect to it. Because Jesus is the truth. When we accept the truth or reject the truth in any degree, we are accepting and rejecting Jesus in some degree. Because the truth is a reflection of who he is. He said, you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. And so I do think it makes a difference what you believe. Now, it doesn't matter what denomination you are part of. If God sends you truth and you reject truth, that's very dangerous. The Bible says if a person continues to sin after they receive a knowledge of the truth, there's no more sacrifice for them. But a certain fearful looking forward to of judgment and fiery indignation. And that doesn't matter what denomination you're in. If you're in the Baptist church and the Lord sends the truth regarding baptism and you reject the Bible teaching on that subject, that's a sin. You see what I'm saying? So God looks on the heart to see if you are receiving the truth and light that Jesus sends your way. Obviously, if I'm a Seventh-day Adventist Christian, I embrace those teachings. But I want you to base your conclusions on what the Bible says. Fair enough? Let's Fair to, enough? Okay, good. Let's go to the family again. What uh, is a wife to do when her husband doesn't want to have the responsibility of his family? What does the Lord have to say about this? Well, the Bible tells us that if any man will not support his own, he's worse than an infidel. Infidel meaning no faith. Um, that's a shameful thing. If... if uh, People lost sometimes take care of their children better than people who supposedly know Jesus and his love. That's a travesty if a Christian is a witness that way. But of course, parents ought to love and supply for their families. Amen? 
didn't God create the angels as children and then they grew up to adults or teens? No, the Bible tells us angels are created full-grown ministering spirits, intelligent. They, are not, they do not procreate. A lot of our ideas about the Bible have been perverted by gothic images. How many of you have seen these images of these naked little fat babies that sit on clouds and play harps and shoot Cupid's arrows? And You know, none of that's in the Bible. And the idea that you die and come back as an angel, there's movies out that seem to say, you know, I'm going to get my angel's wings when I come back. None of that's in the Bible. So these concepts about angels have been affected by uh, a lot of pagan uh, medieval teaching. You'd be surprised how much Greek mythology has influenced Christianity. The idea that the devil's in charge of hell, you've all heard that before? You know, he's got his pitchfork to make sure people cook evenly down in hell and he's in charge of how they burn. We've all seen comics about this. The Bible says that nowhere. I challenge you to show me a scripture that says he's in charge of hell. The Bible says he and his angels are getting cast into the lake of fire. And aren't you glad he's not in charge of hell? Do you think he could be trusted to be fair? Oh, come on. I've been told that Acts 27 and Colossians 2.16 are examples that Sunday keeping has been in effect for thousands of years and is in effect now. Could you please put these verses in proper context? Turn with me in your Bible to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 20, verse 7. Now in your Bibles that would be 1629. That's of course the numbers at the bottom middle. And you have two numbers for our friends who are watching at home. We have seminar Bibles here that are, that are page similar so we can find passages quickly. Now some have used this passage, first of all, when, a, when the Sabbath truth is presented, one of two approaches springs to the surface. First of all, a lot of sincere people will try to prove from the Bible that Sunday is really the Sabbath. Then when that fails, the next approach is to prove that we don't need to keep the commandments anymore. The first approach is, let's show that Sunday is the Sabbath. Now, in the Bible, were the days of the week named or numbered? Numbered. What was Sunday called? First day of the week. Jesus rose on what we call Easter Sunday. The Bible says he rose early the first day of the week. And here's a passage that speaks of the first day of the week. Acts 20, verse 7. And on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, aha, they've come together to break bread. That must be a communion service. They're worshiping. That proves they were worshiping now on the first day of the week. Is that what it says? Let's keep reading. That's how some people interpret that. Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech till midnight. And there were many lights in the upper chamber where they were gathered. Let's stop for a second. Paul starts preaching after dark. He preaches all the way till midnight. When, a day, when does a day begin and end biblically? At sunset. So, when does the first day of the week begin according to our standards? What we would commonly call Saturday night, right? The seventh day, when the sun goes down, it becomes the first day. That's very consistent with everything in the Bible. From even unto even, the days were divided. So here this meeting is taking place on a Saturday night, which they called the first day of the week. Paul, they'd spent all day Sabbath together worshiping. He's preaching to them on midnight because he's going to leave the next day, which is Sunday morning, and go on a journey, which nobody would ever do if it was the Sabbath, when it commence a journey on that day. Let's keep reading here. And there sat in the window a certain young man named Eutychus, being fallen into a deep sleep, and Paul was long preaching. You know, my mother's maiden name is Tarshish. My grandfather says we're related to the Apostle Paul. And when I read this, long preaching, I wonder sometimes if perhaps there is a connection. Incidentally, notice here, fallen into a deep sleep as Paul was long preaching, he sunk down, he, be, he became limp, and he fell out of the window on the third loft and was taken up dead. Which goes further to explain that if preachers preach too long, you can kill people. So, very dangerous. And Paul went down to him and fell on him, embracing him and said, Trouble not yourselves, for his life was in him. I think Paul probably felt a little bit sheepish about this. He preached until he killed the guy. He said, Lord, please resurrect him. And the Lord resurrected Eutychus. Now, why is Luke recording this story? Oh, let me continue. It says here, wherefore, when he was come up again, they went back upstairs and broken bread. Now they're breaking bread again and eaten and talked a long while, even till the break of day, and he departed. He began the journey Sunday morning. Is there anything in this passage that says they were inaugurating a new Sabbath day? 
Is there anything that says that they, they had gathered to worship? No. You know, they used to preach all the time. The Bible says they ate bread, Acts chapter 2, from house to house daily. Does that mean that they had communion services? Are we only supposed to have communion services on Sunday or Saturday? When was the first communion service? Thursday. There's nothing, zero, in this passage that tells us there was anything remotely teaching that this is a new Sabbath day. That's probably all we're going to have time for. One more question. I, I just saw the time clock and we're about out of time. How will our hair be in heaven? How will our hair be? Thank you, Pastor. You're welcome. You know, I share a little personal theory I've got that hair on the head of men is the result of sin the other day. And mustaches on women, too. I don't know. I think that uh, I think everything is going to be beautiful there. But I tell you what, friends, I do resent. I've got this own little peeve that all these commercials and, and magazine articles almost make it seem like if a man loses his hair, it's a birth defect. I am so tired of hearing that. And people are going to such great lengths to hide their glory that you won't catch me doing that. <laughs> Lord says, let your light shine. I'm going to let it shine. Amen? want to thank you for your Bible questions. want to thank those who are worshiping with us through our television program right now. You're joining the New Revelation Bible Study of Amazing Facts, and we're going through the study guide today. This is the only one that doesn't really deal with a, a Bible theme of prophecy, so to speak, but it's so important. Has holy wedlock become unholy deadlock? Now, this lesson is not going to only focus on the subject of marriage. But I think most people at some point in their life are involved in dating, marriage, sex, relationships, not in that order necessarily. And we're going to address all of those things, so I think everybody listening right now can receive a blessing from our study. Let's get right into it. Question number one. Secrets to having a happy home? Establish your own private home. Now, you know, the Bible tells us that Marriage is part of God's plan. One of the first things that the Lord did in the Garden of Eden was he established marriage, the institution male and female. God said it is not good that a man should be alone. All the cows had a bull and uh, all of the animals had their mates, but Adam had no help meet. And so God created a help meet for him. And I heard one preacher say that was not to help meet expenses. She was to be a helper for him. Then God said, a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife, and they become one flesh. The family unit is the foundation for every culture and society. When the family unit crumbles, when it erodes because of moral decay, the whole culture is going to fall. Mark my words. When we lose respect, when the sacred institution of marriage is not respected, the whole culture is going to be suffering as a result of that. Now, one of the things that sometimes causes a problem is a young couple, or an old couple, when they begin a new family unit, they need to have freedom to make these adjustments by themselves. It can sometimes be very difficult when loving and concerned parents, parents-in-law, the in-laws and outlaws, start to move in and live with them. Because I'll tell you what happens when two people get married. Isn't it interesting someone named Bachelor is sharing about marriage with you right now? You know what a bachelor is? It's a rolling stone that gathers no boss. When two people get together, a lot of people enter into a marriage relationship thinking, you know, love is blind and they fail to see one another's faults and they think, I'll change this person. And there are tremendous adjustments. If two people get married at the age of 20 or 25, and let me just share with you out there, we're at a university, a lot of young people, don't start thinking about marriage before you're 25. Now, this is my personal opinion, but I read somewhere your brain is not fully developed. Until you're 25, your brain continues to grow. And I, you know how many marriages fall apart during the age of 18 and 25? And you know what they say? They're not the same person that I thought I married. They're still growing and evolving. Wait until they're done cooking. Then marry them. 
But there are so many adjustments to take place that if you've got the outside influence of not only having to get used to your new wife or your new husband, but their family to boot, it really adds a lot of pressure. And when you look at the statistics of failed marriages, a lot of these failures come because of outside influence of meddling relatives. Amen? So establish your own private home. Number two, continue your courtship. How many, especially the ladies, will say, well, he wasn't like this when we were dating. When we were dating, he was constantly you know, bringing me flowers and calling, and we'd just sit on the phone for endless hours, and when we had nothing to say, we'd listen to each other breathe. And now when he calls, he just wants to know, are you alive? Are the kids alive? Goodbye. You know, and it's just everything's changed. Well, let me tell you something, ladies. Men and women are not only different as far as gender, we are different as far as the way our brains operate. I have heard that ladies are different in the respect that they use both sides of their brain in concert. Men think mostly, uh, help me, is it the left or right? I forget. Left side of the brain. Women interact with both sides, the emotions and the facts. Men are more task-oriented and fact-oriented in their thinking. Men think in terms of headlines. What are the headlines? The ladies want to know, what's the fine print? Now, I really wish Karen was here right now as I share this presentation with you. She'd probably have some things to share herself. It may be better she's not here. But uh, we'll call. You know, I really miss her, and so we're calling every single day. I think there's only been one day that we failed to talk to each other since I've been here. And I'll call and I'll go, are you okay? Are the kids okay? Is the house still there? And she'll say, yes, everything's fine. And then she'll say, so what did you do? You know, and she'll start telling me about what she cooked and where she shopped and, and what happened. And, and she wants to experience the conversation. You know, the man just wants to get the headlines. She wants to find print. When a man is dating, he's using both sides of his brain. And, he, you know, he, he, all of a sudden something kicks in. Once he says, I do, that shuts off. And he doesn't need it anymore. He says, I have conquered the task of marriage. It's not necessary anymore. And ladies, be patient. Men, it is not natural for them. It takes an enormous effort for him to communicate the way that you communicate with each other. Let me give you an illustration of how different they are. If you take a gymnasium and you set up 50 chairs in a great big gymnasium and you set men in the chairs, they're very comfortable, even though they're all spread out with 15 feet around them because they are territorial. They say, I've got my territory, I'm all right. They want to know, what is my space? What do I own? What do I control? And then they're comfortable. You put ladies in a situation like that, when they're so far away from the other ladies in the room, they get very uncomfortable. You take a bunch of men and squeeze them on a couch next to other men, and they look down to see, do I, am I on my own cushion or am I sharing a cushion with this guy? <laughs> we don't know each other that well. And they get real uncomfortable. You put a lot of ladies in a small room like that and you go in there 10 minutes later and they're all sharing the most intimate secrets with these strangers. Part of the reason ladies use both sides of their brain, you've heard of a woman's intuition? That's not a wives' tale. It is true. Because they use both sides, not only do they look at the facts, they have a feeling for things sometimes that men do not know. And the mother will know, you know, there's something wrong with Junior. He's not acting like himself. And the father will look at him and say, well, he's not sneezing. It looks like he's okay to me. And he always thinks in terms of external evidence. But women are very different creatures. Now, when it comes to courtship, men, you have to try. You have to think proactively. You have to say, put, write down weddings and anniversaries and things like that so you're not going to forget. Because unless you write it down, you're going to forget. Unless your wife reminds you. And that's really bad when that happens. So you have to think ahead. You have to make an effort, sometimes for no reason at all. Every now and then, I'll surprise Karen by just sending her some flowers. And, uh, you know, I came into my office one day at the church where I pass her, and there was a dozen roses on the desk. And the secretary was wondering who sent me roses, because it wasn't my wife. I was wondering, too. And so I looked at the little card, and... Uh, Someone was congratulating us because we started our new Bible answer program. It was uh, someone in a business wanted to congratulate us. I thought that was real nice. That was classy. And I looked at those roses and I thought, I'm going to get all the mileage out of this I possibly can. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, I took them home and I said, look, dear, what I brought you. 
And she was thrilled. Then I had to fess up that someone else had given them to me. She said, who gave you roses? And it sort of backfired until I explained. But uh, you've got to do everything you can to think about the courtship. You know, the Bible says, Husbands, love your wives even as Christ loves the church. One thing I notice about Jesus, God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, they're never trying to get happiness for themselves, but Jesus and God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, are always giving the glory and the credit to the others. God, Jesus is always glorifying the Father. The Father is always glorifying the Son. The Spirit is always glorifying the Father and the Son. That's the secret to a happy home. Try to outgive the other person. Try to outlove them. The reason so many marriages fail today is because people marry somebody because of what they do for them. I want you to do this for me and be this for me. You're doomed to fail. Stop thinking of what that person is going to be and do for you. Husbands, if you treat your wife like a queen, she'll treat you like a king. Ladies, if you treat him like a king, he'll treat you like a queen. It, you just try and out love the other person. You've got to continue the courtship all through the marriage, and it takes effort to remember these things. It does not happen like you see. We have been polluted in our thinking by the media and TV. You know that? Soap operas, as my stomach turns and all the rest of them, <laughs> they, they kind of convey this image that just life is one big mushy romance, you know, and intrigue, and, and it's not like that. Life is dirty diapers and runny noses and, and washing dishes and changing oil in the cars, and, you know, that's life. And Hollywood never conveys it that way, and sometimes move, people move into marriages, and then they find out what reality is, and they've got unrealistic expectations. Don't forget that word. Two words. Unrealistic expectations. That's what causes a lot of problems in the first couple of years of marriage. Be realistic instead of idealistic. Number three, remember that God joined you in marriage. Marriage is not an experiment. Some people get married so often in our society that they ought to sign their certificates to whom it may concern. I mean, people enter into marriages, and because divorce is so rampant, folks say, well, if it doesn't work out, I'll just uh, find someone else and do it again. If you're a Christian, that's not an option. You can't think that way. Marriage is a divine institution. The Bible says you become one flesh. And I have not yet seen a divorce where people did not tear from limb to limb eternally. When there's a divorce, not only are the children torn apart inside. Now, friends, I wish I could tell you different, but I know what I'm talking about. My father was married four times. He's married now to his fourth wife. My mother was married four times. Not to mention my mother lived with a fellow 20 years. She never married. Didn't marry him because he was married to someone else. I mean, I know all the ins and outs of these scrambled relationships from growing up. I've had stepfathers and stepmothers and stepbrothers and the whole mess. And it's only a miracle of grace that I'm not scrambled in my emotions right now. I read when I was up in the cave a psalm. It said, when your father and mother forsake you, the Lord will take you up. And I asked Jesus to adopt me, and that's the only reason I've got any sanity at all. I used to have to go to parties where I'd have to pretend I didn't know this man my mother was living with because he was with his wife. Very confusing. My stepmother right now is younger than my wife. My father's 75. You know what her name is? Mary Ann Batchelor. Can you imagine having the name Mary A. Batchelor? <laughs> and so, you know, it's just real. Listen to this, it gets really exciting. My father has brother in laws. He's 75, he's got brother in laws that are 13 years old, 14 years old? Take them out on a business lunch with you. This is my brother-in-law. <laughs> Listen now, my father, my father's mother-in-law is younger than me. Now you're really confused. Don't try and figure it out. It's true. And so I know something. Those are my credentials. And as a pastor, you have a lot of time that you spend counseling people. I've just seen everything you can imagine and some things you can't imagine happen in relationships. Number four, guard your thoughts. Don't let your senses trap you. Now this would be not only for those that are in marriage, but those that are dating. A lot of people get into trouble when they're dating because they're not controlling their thinking. Let's talk for a minute about sex. Sex happens in the mind. 
a lot of people think that sex is the result of what's happening below the waist. No, it really happens here. Success as a Christian begins with being pure in heart. That's talking about as a man thinks in his heart. You cannot be in the kingdom. Blessed are the pure in heart, they will see God. One of the things you've got to do when you become a Christian is ask the Holy Spirit to control your thoughts. And how many people have gotten in trouble dating and in marriage because they were not letting the Holy Spirit to control their thoughts and they allow the mind to wander in forbidden zones. Make up your mind in advance that some things are not admissible. And as soon as the devil begins to plant forbidden suggestions, put them out of your mind. Now, men and women are stimulated differently. A man is stimulated visually, as well as other ways, but visually. That's why pornography sells. A man can look at a dirty magazine. He doesn't need to be formally introduced to the people in the magazine. He doesn't really care. A man can be stimulated by a woman's figure, whether it's moving or stationary. God designed it that way. God put that in man. But we're in a society where people are not dressing very modestly, which makes it very difficult for men to keep their minds pure. Amen? The men ought to be saying amen. <laughs> the ladies are going to be thinking I'm the only pervert in the room. So I need a little support, guys. A man is attracted to certain curves in a woman's figure. That's why they call Corvette sexy. And guitars are so popular. It's the curves. Women ought to dress in such a way that everything is a little high enough, low enough, and loose enough so that what a man sees when he looks at you is not all the curves. Amen? I think Christians, the Bible says it's a sin for a man to look on the opposite sex in lust. Do we all agree? Is it a sin for a woman to dress deliberately in such a way as to get men to look? And a lot of women think, well, they all got dirty minds. We can't help it. We're, no, we're made where we're stimulated visually. And we can help it. I take it, I take it back. But a man has to use unnatural effort. If a man sees an attractive young girl with a good figure walking across the street in a bikini, he will automatically look unless he asks the Holy Spirit. And, you know, incidentally, guys, if you first notice that, it's not a sin. It's when you continue to dwell upon the, the subject, it turns into a sin. Amen? You cannot prevent the birds from flying over your head, but you can prevent them from making a nest in your hair. Having a visual observation is different from having an imagination that gets carried away. A man will automatically look at something like that. And so that's when he needs to pray the Holy Spirit will help him refocus his attention before he starts delving into the forbidden zone of committing adultery in his mind. Amen? And so you've got to keep your thoughts pure. Not only when it comes to that, but sometimes when you're dating, the thoughts lead to actions, and the actions lead to reactions. A lot of people get in trouble when they're dating because they don't have a plan. Keep your mind busy doing good things, and you won't start thinking up other things to do. Stay in a group. Young people, when they're dating, sometimes get in trouble because a guy who's young and healthy and all the plumbing's working is with a girl and who's in the same situation. And there's a very strong temptation for these young people to make sure everything's working. When they've got these bodies and all the hormones are raging through their bloodstreams, and all they're seeing on TV and in the videotapes almost makes it seem like sex is like shaking hands. Am I right? Isn't that what Hollywood's doing? There's tremendous pressure on young people to go against the scriptural teaching that you should not fool around until you're married. Amen? Now, Pastor Doug was not always a Christian. And I am ashamed of things I did when I was a young man. My mother used to tell me, as long as you don't get a girl pregnant, I don't care what you do. This is how I grew up. My father offered to send a prostitute to my hotel room when we were on the road together one time. I mean, I grew up with no morals at all. And there are things I wish I could forget because when you do things before you're married, your imagination is forever scarred with things that will infringe on that sanctity. God designed, got real quiet in here all of a sudden. God designed one man, one woman, one relationship, and you don't have to worry about your imagination when it happens according to God's plan. Young people who think, well, we'll probably get married later, and they sacrifice their convictions, 
And then the relationship and the dating breaks off and they've gone through two or three or four or more of these failed dating relationships where they're living with people. If you want to find out what a potential future husband or wife is like, you don't find out in the bedroom. Share a checkbook, not a bed. If you want to find out what it's going to be like, amen? You know, the number one reason first marriages fail in the first two years is finances. One of the main reasons second marriages fail is stepchildren. But finances, very few marriages fail because the plumbing isn't working. Don't worry, it's going to work. The checkbook may not work. She might be a spendaholic or something like that. See if you can share a checkbook first. Where am I? Number four, I better move along. I've got a lot of opinions on these things. Never retire for the night angry with each other. Let not the sun go down on your wrath. Some uh, people were interviewing an old couple been married for 70 years. And they asked the husband, they said, to what do you attribute your long and happy marriage? He said, my wife and I made a decision never to go to sleep while we were angry with each other. He said, of course, there were weeks when we didn't sleep. But uh, <laughs> Now, there are going to be times in a marriage where you disagree. You need to learn to communicate in the appropriate way. For one thing, if you're dating a young man, ladies, if he's not respecting your body while you're dating, do you think he'll respect it more after you're, after you're married? If he hits you when you're dating, you just wait until you're married. That's a bad sign. If you're dating a young man and he gets angry and violent with you when you're dating, that ought to be immediate red flags to call the whole thing off. It's so much easier when you're dating. Don't even consider him as there's a lot of fish in the sea. Don't think there's no one else out there for me. And a lot of young men and a lot of young women get into relationships thinking, well, I'm afraid to break off this one because I don't know if I'll find somebody else. You give it to God and I promise you, he'll find someone else. You put God first. It's so much easier when you're dating than to make those big mistakes later. But you've got to learn to communicate. If you cannot communicate peacefully with your spouse because you're in danger of losing your temper, get something to eat. Now, Karen and I know each other. And we're a little different. When she gets hungry, she gets ugly. She'll admit it. She'll say, it's true. If her blood sugar gets low and you get out of her way. And sometimes when Karen and I are having a little problem, I'll say, let me get you something to eat. And <laughs> then that makes her mad too. <laughs> now, I'm the other way around. I can go a long time without eating. I've eaten once today. It doesn't bother me. But if I get sleepy, get out of my way. And sometimes Karen and I have to declare a truth so we can go to sleep and the next morning we'll deal with the issue. She'll have breakfast, I'll be rested, and everything's okay. We can handle it then, see? And so see, if you can't communicate peacefully, get away until you can. Some spouses, men and women, get angry and they refuse to talk about things that need to be dealt with. You might try writing a letter to the person you're dating or married to, to try and communicate these things. But if you're not communicating when you're dating, remember this, whatever happens when you're dating is accelerated once you're married. If you're not communicating well in your dating, find someone else. Of course, you might be the problem too. Fix the problem. But whatever happens to dating will be magnified later on. But do not let the sun go down Bury the hatchet, so to speak, but not in each other before you retire. Number six, keep Christ the center of your home. Jesus said, can two walk together unless they're agreed? Some marriages just do not work out very well because one's going this way and one's going this way. If Jesus is the destination for both parties, you're automatically moving towards Christ. Some families will pray over their food at meals, but they don't pray together as husband and wife. If a husband and a wife are Christian and they're not praying together, I question their Christianity. Karen and I go to sleep every night, and I'm not setting us up with the example, I'm just letting you into our family a little bit. We have prayer together. We take hands, right? We're laying in bed there together. And 
we have prayer. We pray about the things of the day. We commit our lives to the Lord. We have personal prayer, and we also pray together. You'll find out it really bonds you together when you keep reprioritizing your family with Jesus in the middle. If Jesus is your destination, you will automatically continue to move towards each other. Which brings me to another very, very important point. Everybody listening? If you're not married, do not marry an unbeliever if you're a believer. Say amen. amen. You do not grab a rattlesnake by its head. You do not put black widows in your clothes hamper. You do not drink strychnine. And you do not marry someone who is not of the same denomination. And you know what? Every pastor knows that this is a problem. Most pastors, the Baptists, will not marry one of his members to a Catholic. Catholics will not marry their people to Methodists. It causes terrible problems for the children. They're getting pulled in so many different directions and they're confused. Marry someone of the same faith. Now, a lot of you out there going, uh, what, I'm already in a situation like this. What do I do? Tough. No. <laughs> Do everything you can to find common ground and love each other with the common ground you have. Do not sacrifice principles of truth. If you are married to an unbeliever, make sure that the children have exposure to Christ and the truth and Christianity. Sometimes it can be their saving. Some people enter into marriages thinking, well, I know he's not a believer now, but he's sure cute and he's sure nice, and uh, I think I'll convert him afterwards. Oh, famous last words. You know how many times I've heard people say that? And what often happens is the unbelieving spouse converts the believer to be an unbeliever. And they stop going to church. Very dangerous. You know, Samson, he was into mixed marriages. You read, read his story? Oh, it backfired big time. Find people of your own faith. And when, when Samson said to his parents, Oh, but I want to marry her. They said, can't you find someone of your own faith? She said, oh, but she pleaseth me well. I want her. She's pretty. She's attractive. And how many young men get into a marriage with a pretty young thing because of looks and they're just looking on the outside? It's like buying a house because of the paint. It's going to fade and peel someday. Amen? Sometimes those houses add on, too, as the years go by. <laughs> Number seven, I already touched on this a little bit, pray together, and you'll find it really bonds your, your lives when you spend time in family worship. Pray with the children in the morning. Number eight, very important, agree that divorce is not the answer. When you first enter into a marriage, make it clear that divorce is not an option. If you have any questions as you're, you know, a lot of young people, they'll set a date for marriage, and as they're moving towards that date, they're uneasy. Cancel it. I don't care if you're standing there with $10,000 worth of wedding preparations, you've got all your friends and family there, you're in front of the minister, you're getting ready to say, I do. If you know that's not the right person, then you say, I don't. It's easier then to pay $10,000 than to pay alimony later on. Do not make a mistake of going into a marriage if you are not sure that this is the person that God has led you to. Amen? You've got to be very sure. If you're not very sure, keep postponing the date. You don't have to rush into these things. A lot of folks think, oh, I don't think I'll be able to control myself. I don't know if I can wait that long. That's another reason to wait. Wait until you know you can control yourself. Number nine, keep the family circle to closed tightly. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 13, a friend knows how to conceal a matter. You ought to be able to share things in your family that aren't in the street the next day. Some women wonder why their husbands seem a little distant, and the husbands find out that anything they tell their wives, their wives then tell their girlfriends. And all of a sudden, that husband gets the idea, she's closer to them than me. I cannot trust her. It violates the faith and the sanctity of that relationship. And I don't keep secrets from my wife. People will tell me things, and they'll say, now I'm going to tell you something, but don't tell anyone else. And I say, now my wife and I are one flesh, and I'm going to tell her, I hope that's okay. And I can trust my wife. I'll say, Karen, this is something that someone shared with me. We need to keep it just among ourselves. But I've got to have someone I can talk to, and I can trust my wife. 
you've got to have trust with each other. As soon as you start hiding things from one another, then your trust begins to deteriorate. But family things, every family's got its little idiosyncrasies and secrets. Keep it in the family. Amen? Number 10, God describes love. Make it your daily goal to measure up. You know, it tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, you ought to read this, not necessarily now, but mark it in your Bible. God's definition of love. Love is forbearing and kind. Love knows no jealousy. Love does not brag. It is not conceited. She is not unmannerly, nor selfish, nor irritable, nor mindful of wrongs. She does not rejoice in injustice, but joyfully sides with the truth. She can overlook faults. She is full of trust, full of hope, full of endurance. Love is patient. Number 11. Remember, criticism and nagging destroy love. Now, this is one area, and I don't want to overgeneralize, but some women wonder why the men are out a lot and they don't spend enough time at home. The man feels like he's getting beat up whenever he comes home, so the natural reaction is to put it off as long as possible. Make sure that you know how to encourage one another. You know, you can make a world of difference. Sometimes a, a man will come home and the wife has been working all day long, taking care of the children, cooking the food, and uh, just slaving under all kinds of adverse conditions, and he'll notice one thing wrong. Instead of praising her for all the good that she's done, men, I'll tell you a little secret. When you come home, look your wife over real carefully. See if there's any changes. You can keep out of a lot of trouble if you notice something like a new dress or a haircut. Sometimes Karen will say, do you notice anything? And I'll say, oh, you got your hair perm. She said, yeah, last month I cleaned the house. <laughs> and so, you know, I, you got to really be observant is my advice. But don't criticize and nag. Uh, a lot of marriages have been destroyed. They've been buried by little digs, one shovel at a time. Number 12, do not overdo anything. Be temperate. Now, in your family, you can overdo work. Men, you listening? In your zeal for trying to provide for the family, you can find out you're 50 years old, your wife has now left you because you had no relationship, the kids are grown, you've got lots of money and no family. You can become a workaholic. And I have to guard that. I'm very busy and Karen has to keep reminding me, if you save the world and lose your family, what good is it? So I have to keep scheduling time just for the family. That's why Karen's coming out for these meetings. You have to spend time together. Relationships do not do well. Spoke to my son today. Tried to talk to him for a long time. Asked how school was going. And you've got a bond like that. You can get too busy with work. You can get too busy with rest. Like the couch potato in my picture there. Too much of anything. Too much food is not good. Even good food. Too much vacation is not good. You've got to come home and recover from your vacation. How many of you then pay for it? How many of you discovered that? You know something else? Uh, people sometimes do too much sex before marriage. Of course, any is too much. Too much before and none afterwards. You've got to have moderation in all things, but you can have too much even afterwards too. Now, I... This is very delicate. And I get questions on this I generally don't read specifically, and I'm not about to do that now. But let me see if I can frame this carefully. Even within marriage, the Bible says the marriage bed is undefiled, but that does not mean that even in a marriage where you're legally married, there cannot be perversion. Some things are a little weird and kinky, and you just got to you know, pray that the Holy Spirit is going to guide you in what's appropriate and what's not appropriate, and would you want Jesus to come in such situations you might get some counseling in those respects. But there are a lot of extremes in our society. We're being fed a lot of things that are kind of strange and weird. And we need to pray that God will guide us with his spirit. Amen? Be temperate in all things. Number 13, respect each other's personal rights and privacies. Now, though I do not keep secrets from Karen, she realizes that I want to honor that Doug has certain things that are his. I have my desk. She's free to go on my desk. I don't lock it, but she doesn't. I have my mail. I don't care if she opens my mail, but when we go through the mail, anything that has my name on it, she puts in front of me that I might read it. Same thing. I put her stuff. She's got, she's got mail and catalogs that come. I'd like to throw in the garbage, but I put them there on the desk for her to look at. 
you've got to respect each other's place. Amen? A lot of marriages, I know a man, he is so controlling with his wife. When she gets off the phone, he picks up the phone and presses redial to find out who she's talking to. And it just destroys the relationship. You need to respect each other's personal rights. Number 14, be clean, modest, orderly, and dutiful. That's my old picture up there. <laughs> now, you know, when I lived in a cave, I want to let you know right now, you can ask Karen when she gets here, it was the cleanest cave in the mountains. I went to military school when I was five and again when I was 11 to 13, and I'm very neat. You go look where I'm staying right now, I've got everything in its place. Matter of fact, Karen thinks that I'm, I'm kooky because I'm so neat. But I, I think husbands ought to help clean. Wash the dishes. I just made a lot of friends all around the world. I help make the bed every morning. Karen and I sleep in it together. I figure we can make it together. Now, if she stays in bed when I go to work, it's up to her. Sometimes the baby keeps her up and she's still in bed. But we make the bed together. I wash dishes. I help clean the house. I clean the office. I know how to vacuum. You know, husbands, this, nowhere in the Bible does it say this is woman's work. And I think that everybody, you know, we all need to work together in a family. And ladies, you can pull weeds. You can work out in the garden. You can mow the lawn. I mean, you know, sometimes ladies play dumb because they want the men to do it. They're not stupid. They'll say, I'd like to hang a picture right there. And then they'll go punch a hole in the wall with a hammer on purpose, knowing the husband will never ask them to pick up a hammer again. And they think we're stupid. You know, I did that one time. Wife was gone, and Micah was about 19 months old, and he changed his, he needed a change of the serious variety. And uh, so I timed it just right. When I heard Mom was coming home, I was out in the front yard. I picked up Micah by his hind foot, and I was hosing him off like this when she walked home. She never asked me to change him again. So... But we all, I do change diapers. She figured out what I was up to. Where am I? Number 15, determined to speak softly and kindly. You know, respect, why is it that sometimes people respect their enemies and neglect their spouses? Sometimes we're kinder to strangers than we are to our own family. You might be thinking, oh, Doug, I don't know how I can stay married to this person. It's like they're... It's like they're my enemy. Well, you know what, friends? Jesus said, love your enemy. Some of us are in difficult marriages because Jesus is helping you develop character fit for heaven. You hear that? You're thinking, if I get out of this marriage, everything will be all right. You're going to find yourself in the same situation. And how many times as a pastor, I've watched people get out of a marriage because they're unsatisfied. They automatically are attracted to the same kind of opposite individual, and it's fine for the courtship, and pretty soon, a few years later, they're in the very same situation, sometimes worse. If God gives you lemonade, unless you've got biblical grounds, I'm sorry, if he gives you a lemon, you make lemonade. Amen? Learn to love that person. Pray for their conversion. We want everything to be perfect. And you know what? I have never yet met a marriage that's that way. We all have sinful natures we need to work with. Amen? And we're learning how to be Christians by loving people that are sometimes unlovable. You hearing me? Sometimes we have to bear a cross in a marriage. But marriage is a commitment that should last. Be reasonable in money matters. I've told you finances are the downfall of many marriages. Consult on big expenditures. I don't go out and buy a car and say, honey, look what I bought. We work together on the big expenses. Karen knows that she has a certain realm of things that she buys for you know, her responsibilities we've agreed on. There's certain things I buy. I don't have to go consult her if I want to get a club for the steering wheel. You know what I'm saying? So you have to have a little attitude, but don't run up big bills that you're going to have to pay together without consulting one another. That's disrespectful for someone you love. Let the left hand know what the right hand is doing in those things. Number 17, talk things over and counsel together freely and often. Keep communicating with each other. If, if Karen has one beef with me, it's, she said, Doug, I always hear about what's happening from other people before I hear from you. Y'all find out that you're doing a meeting in Tasmania next year, and I didn't know that. I thought you ought to tell me. Sometimes I'm making decisions and, and plans, and I'm not communicating with her. And that's hard on a relationship. You've got to be sure to, and like I said, it's easier for ladies than men. It's more natural for ladies to debrief with one another of what's going on in their lives. Men figure, as long as I know what's going on, 
to tell someone else is like a sign of weakness or something. You gotta make yourself communicate and give the details to your spouse or your girlfriend and they'll feel like they're involved in your life. Some marriages fall apart because the wife feels like I'm not part of his life anymore. He doesn't tell me what's going on in his life. And you've got to involve one another. And then the last question is, are you wanting to have this kind of marriage? Let me read it to you right out of here. Are you praying that your home will be a place where the angels of heaven will feel comfortable? Is your answer yes? God can work in your marriages that you're preparing for if you're dating now, or you may already be in a marriage. If you and your spouse agree, your house can be a little bit of heaven on earth, believe it or not. Marriages are made in heaven. So is thunder and lightning. There'll be a few storms sometimes, but you can ride out the storms with Christ's grace.